psychology. So when I say that to people, they usually think this. Food plus psychology. Okay, I got it. I talk to food. But I'm sorry, Professor Hudler. I don't talk to mushrooms. I don't talk to tomatoes. And I don't talk to french fries. Instead, where nutrition science focuses on what's in your food, the biology, the biochemistry, and the physiology, what you should eat, food psychology looks at why and how. So food psychology is a mashup of behavioral economics, social psychology, and nutrition to ask the hard questions of how do we change behavior around food, promote positive intake, and more importantly, understand the underlying beliefs beside why people believe what they eat. So I want to take a back step and talk about behavioral economics. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, on the left is Superman, or I guess it's your right. And Superman is the classic economic model. He's rational, he always does what's in the best interest of the population, and he's always trying to maximize his utility. On the other side, we have Homer Simpson. And Homer Simpson is the classic behavioral economic model. Now Homer, he does things because he feels like it, he does things because he's emotional, or sometimes he does things because he doesn't understand why. So I want to take a step back and talk about why I do what I do. And I say that more so to kind of enlighten you as to kind of a turning point in your life than to make you feel bad. So I, I grew up, I was always overweight. I was always the bigger kid. People always made fun of me. I was picked last in gym class. But, but more importantly to you, there's a moment in your life or a series of events that will shape who you become in the future. So I want to leave that with you to start off before we get into kind of the meat of it. So we make about 250 food choices a day, and most of them are subconscious. So our next couple of minutes together, we want to go below the ice, break the surface, and talk about some of the subconscious factors that influence how much we eat and why we eat it. So freshman year, great time. But while all my friends for spring break went off to Mexico and warm beaches with bottomless umbrella drinks, I soaked up the rays beneath the golden arches. Yes, I spent the entire week at McDonald's looking at people eat french fries, Big Macs, and really, really big sodas. So what did I find? Of course, because this was a scientific experiment, I'm sure you'll all want to reproduce it. So the sweet spot, how to not get caught watching people eat, look sideways. So look exactly where the lower jaw meets the upper cheek, and you'll see exactly how many times someone chews without them getting up into your face and saying, hey, why are you looking at me eat? <laughs> so can I have a volunteer? Someone? Okay, I'll pick you, Sasha. So which one would you rather eat? Chocolate pudding or decadent chocolate mousse with freshly whipped cream and a shaving of extra fine dark chocolate? Which one? Yeah. So what about that? Okay. <coughs> what about now? Okay, I mean, so unless you're at Lester's restaurant and you're paying a full tab, if we go back to the first example, this one, what happens is that when you read that on a menu, which is what we do mostly, you see that on the right. But now when you go back to this one, your perception shapes your reality. So if you saw the second one on a menu, it sounds really, really good in your head, so when you get it, it's going to taste much, much better, and you're going to be willing to pay more money for it. So this was an experiment a couple years ago. A team of researchers came to Cornell to learn more about food psychology. After eight hours of symposiums, discussions, and demonstrations, everybody was famished. We went back to my advisor's house, and um, being the only undergraduate there, I was the chef, chef de cuisine. So I go back into the kitchen, and I mean, I think I'm a good cook, but maybe not that good. So I go, I, I bang around some pots, make people wait, and tell them, oh yeah, it's gonna be really, really, really good. So right before dinner's about to be served, I go on the computer, and make this. All the foods sounded really, really good. New England bisque with North Atlantic lobster, mixed crisp garden greens, chicken marsala, empire steak garden lasagna, and of course, fall vegetable medley julienne. Now, who doesn't want to eat that? So the dinner goes really, really well. By the end, everyone's asking, so do you cater bar mitzvahs, weddings? And that's when I go, wait guys, so I have a secret. I didn't actually cook any of this. Everything came from my bits. So again, even after eight hours of lectures on why this works and how it works, people still fell for all the tricks. So I want to talk a little bit about menu psychology um, because now it's part of the Affordable Care Act. So all locations with more than 20 locations will have calorie living on their menus. But does it work? I mean, it kind of goes back to Superman again. If we have more information, of course we're gonna make the best decision, but it doesn't happen. Only about 8% of people respond to calorie labeling on menus and change their behavior. 
So there are some solutions, though. So back to Homer Simpson, here he demonstrates a really cool phenomenon called choice architecture. So it goes back to the 1930s. A behavioral psychologist named Edward Tolman published a paper on the law of least effort. Yes, he published a paper saying that people were lazy and got it published in a journal. <laughs> so what Tolman said is that if you make the easiest choice, the healthiest choice, people will go for it almost every single time. So here, Apu and his little sneer says, Homer, I'm going to get you to eat more fruits, but you're not even going to know it. So choice architecture lets you maintain a choice positive environment that still promotes or nudges behaviors that you want people to do. Next was a project we did with the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. And they said, Daniel, we have this new food icon. It's going to come out in June. How can we get people to know about it? So just seven days after Mrs. Obama announced the new national food icon, My Plate, we launched a mobile app of it. So where the government used to say, OK, we'll make postcards and we'll make posters and people will find out about it eventually, we said, why don't we just launch it? And within days, thousands of people had already seen it. And you guys can try it. It still works from your mobile phone, a touch based interface directly from the policy documents. So then they said, OK, nutrition education is always boring. And I said, well, what if it doesn't have to be? So we came up with this. education was born. So I want to give you one last tip, and that's to start really, really, really small. So if tomorrow you want to run a marathon, instead, start today with putting your shoes on as you get home from work or class. And what you'll find is that over time is that habits become behaviors, and behaviors become lifestyles, and lifestyles become permanent. So I want to leave with one last note, and that on our campus where any person, any study is the motto, how will you fill your plate? And I thought it was only appropriate that it's getting close to dinner, that this wouldn't be empty. Thank you. <laughs>